Today I'm going to get into this paper about how information flows from the world to China, but I'll also be talking a bit more broadly at the onset around uh, information control in the Chinese context. So as digital communication technologies have revolutionized the way that information can flow across borders, it's definitely the case that countries around the world are starting to impose more and more barriers to prevent this transnational flow of information. So in 2021, um, Access Now and a coalition of other nonprofit organizations found that there were 182 internet shutdowns in um, dozens of countries around the world. And oftentimes these shutdowns are occurring during periods of protests, civil unrest, and crises. And of course, internet shutdowns is just one of many ways in which governments can uh, suppress or limit the transnational flow of information across borders and boundaries. Other countries uh, from Russia to Iran, Uganda, uh, Cambodia have implemented countrywide firewalls to filter what information can enter its borders digitally. But probably uh, China, as um, Patricia has mentioned, is leading the pack when it comes to imposing flows on not only the transnational flow of information, but the domestic one. And I think we can say, we can use such a phrase as this, uh, and not, for it not to be hyperbole, 
these digital communication technologies have led to an explosion of information. And so we're in a world where there's more information than ever before, and the Chinese government is censoring it in a selective manner. Um, so this is a really large organizational effort that involves many different levels of government in China and different bureaucracies. It's obviously designed to suppress information, but when we examine it at scale, we can actually learn something and sometimes something new about the goals, intentions, and actions of the Chinese regime. So in some ways, this is, a, this is paradoxical because authoritarian regimes tend to want to control and suppress information, especially about its own actions and strategies. Uh, but in doing large scale content removal and censorship, it leaves a footprint. So that's something we can use to learn more about uh, these regimes. OK, uh, so I do want to be clear that for the Chinese Communist Party, when it comes to their aspirations for digital media, they've been quite transparent. So this is from the 2018 State Council Opinions on Promoting the Healthy and Orderly Development of New Media and Government Affairs. And this document, along with others, make it very clear that the CCP's goal for, for digital media is one, to amplify the voice of the Chinese Communist Party, to create positive propaganda for the party and government, to interpret central policies, and to guide public opinion, especially in response to sudden unexpected, unexpected events. So the Chinese Communist Party is clear that social media and these digital communication technologies is really about serving the goal of preserving the power of, of the party. And so in other words, um, we shouldn't think of digital spaces in China as first and foremost about free expression or mobilization coordination, not even necessarily about stimulating economic production and growth but really about serving the interests and goals of the, of the CCP so that it can shape what people know, what they believe, what they want to do, and how they behave. Um, when we turn and look at the strategies of, uh, of, of the CCP, I typically think of it as censorship on one hand and content creation on the other. And I don't use the word propaganda purposefully because people use the term from very differently in different sub-disciplines sub and different fields. And so I'll show you examples of content creation. And I think some people will see those examples as propaganda, and others may not. Okay, so we can talk about that more in Q&A. Um, and then another dimension in which there's different strategies is domestic, actions oriented toward the domestic information environment, and then actions oriented at uh, this transnational flow of information. So looking at censorship and domestic strategies, what's well known is search filtering. So if you search on Baidu, which is a dominant search engine in China, the results you get will be very different than if you're using Google in the US. Um, keyword blocking is if you go on certain social media platforms in China, you try to make a post, it will not be made public because it contains certain phrases or keywords. Uh, count bans, that's familiar to everyone, and then content removal is a post hoc removal of content that's already appeared online. And so there's some things here where uh, it's predetermined and others that are post hoc. So when I think about government strategies for censorship, there are some things that a government like China knows ahead of time that it doesn't want people to have too much information about. Uh, and that's where search filtering and keyword blocking comes in. But there are other things that happen, uh, oftentimes sudden events, that the government then wants to suppress, and so that's post hoc. So these domestic strategies of censorship include both. Um, and as Patricia mentioned in my early work with Gary King and Molly Roberts, we look at what is censored um, by the Chinese government across a number of different social media platforms. And we find that, at least at this time period, it was really about suppressing information related to collective action. And so in this figure, we have uh, content that's critical of the state in red, supportive of the state in green. The vertical axis is the percent that are censored. We find that what is censored is discussions online pertaining to collective action events, whereas other discussions not related to collective action is not censored, regardless of whether it's critical. So I think there is a need, so this was done 10 years ago. 
I think there's a need to redo this type of research today, and I often get asked the question, does this, hold, does this finding still hold? We can find examples where criticisms of the state are removed. But I think one thing, so I think that's an empirical question that someone should answer. But I think one thing to know is that in this, in this, uh, in this theory, sometimes criticism of the state is censored. It just happens to be when it's related to events that are about mobilization and collective action. Okay. Um, then if we turn to the content creation side of things, the CCP has made very clear that the government should have a presence on social media platforms and the internet in general. And when I say the word government, I mean all levels of government in China. So China has a central government, it then has provinces, cities, then counties, and below counties you have um, uh, sub-districts and then villages slash, slash neighborhoods depending on whether you're in urban or rural China. And so when I say the government, I'm referring to all these different levels of government. Uh, and the central government has asked all these different levels to create government accounts uh, in terms of websites and accounts on different social media platforms. So Weibo, for those less familiar with um, social media in China, is the most Twitter-like platform. Then we have WeChat, which is I guess began as a messaging group, messaging-based app, but is used for many, many things and then Douyin, which is the Chinese branding for TikTok. Uh, so this is explicit in government documents that these are the three platforms that, government, that the Chinese government needs to dominate. Um, and when we look at Douyin, so this is the Chinese TikTok, we collected data on, we collected trending data related to trending videos from March to June of 2020. So we have about 50,000 unique videos from 10,000 accounts. Uh, so we collected all of the videos that were trending. And nearly 50% come from state media. And then another 7% from the government and Chinese Communist Party accounts. Celebrities only account for 10% of trending videos. Non-state media, less than 10%. Ordinary users, so these are uh, users without account verification, uh, are 23%. So I don't know how many people here use TikTok but this is completely different than what you would see on TikTok. You would not see media uh, accounts uh, dominating um, the trending videos on TikTok. But on uh, Douyin, TikTok in China, this is a very different picture. Uh, and so based on this research, we wanted to actually try to get a sense of how much regime related, how many regime related accounts are there on Douyin and what are they doing? And so um, what we've done is starting actually with the trending videos that are from state media or the Chinese government, we then identified who all they follow and then we evaluated among their follows which are state media and government accounts and then we did that again for looking at the followings of those, who, who those accounts follow. And so in total we identified over, we have identified over 20,000 regime affiliated accounts on Douyin. And you can see that they are from all different levels of government and bureaucracies. So this is a working paper. Uh, on the x-axis we have central level accounts, provincial level, prefecture, which is the same as city, and then county. And then we have different functional bureaucracies from the kind of government office, which is kind of the office of the mayor you can think of, uh, state media, Propaganda department, which is what we typically think of as leading the charge on information control in China. Youth League, Com Chinese Communist Youth League, security apparatus, firefighters, travel broadcasts, other departments, and other accounts. And unlike what we expected, it is not the case that it's only state media and propaganda departments that are involved in putting out content related to the government. In fact, it's the security apparatus and I should also say firefighters in China are part of the militarized police. <laughs> so security apparatus and firefighters kind of go together. Uh, they have the most, um, uh, they are most active in uh, running accounts on Douyin and I should also say putting out content regularly. Uh, so just looking at this one platform, Douyin, it's very clear that in just in the last few years, the Chinese government and CCP has made extensive efforts to penetrate the space. 
And I think if you compare it to how frequently government officials or government bureaucracies are on TikTok, this is there's again a completely different, um, a different world. All right. Then turning to transnational strategies, this is what I'll talk more about today. It's the so-called Great Firewall, which is technical strategies as well as regulatory controls that limit what information can be seen within China uh, when you're inside, inside the country. Uh, and then on content creation side of transnational strategies, in the last few years, China has also worked hard to expand its presence on global uh, social media platforms. And this was made explicit in uh, 2016. There's a new policy called China Going Global in which the CCP set as a strategy to be present on global social media platforms. And so this is just taking a look at Twitter. And this is the historical daily follower account on Twitter for four flagship Chinese uh, state media outlets. CGTN was rebranded in 2017 from CCTV. Uh, then you have Xinhua, which is the kind of Reuters uh, AP uh, for, uh, of China. Then you have People's Daily and then China Daily. And so you can see from 2017 to 2020, all of these outlets experience rapid growth in terms of followership and CGTN the most. So you can also see there's this plateauing that happened right before the beginning of 2020. And that's when the social media platforms began labeling. Um, these accounts as state affiliated. So that labeling definitely had a effect in uh, stopping the growth of followers, but didn't really lead to a decline of followers. Uh, in case you're wondering, are these all just all bots? It, it, the evidence suggests that's not the case. So you see this dip here in 2018 in almost all of the lines. That uh, is, reflects Twitter's mass culling of inauthentic accounts in that year. And so if we believe that Twitter was not too bad at culling inauthentic accounts, then it's not, yes, all of these outlets had some um, inauthentic accounts that were followers, but it's not the case that these accounts accounted for all of the followers. And we've also done additional analysis using uh, different tools for bot uh, detection. And we do not find that this is just an artifact of artificially inflated followership. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, one thing just to note here is that when we look at where these followers are located, they are not predominantly in North America or Europe, Western Europe. They're primarily in South Asia, South Asia Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan <coughs> Africa, and Latin America. So the target audience is not us here in the US. Um, because we will, so that, that's just something to keep in mind, that China's uh, expansion on the content creation side globally is not really primarily toward the, the West, but toward many other countries around the world. Okay, I should just mention that all of these digital strategies of censorship and content creation are, uh, we can't think about them in isolation because they're very closely tied and supported by non-digital strategies of information control. So on the censorship side, you have state control of broadcast media, you have uh, expulsion of foreign media or lim extreme limits on foreign media, surveillance of uh, journalists who remain in China, as well as repression of online key opinion leaders. So you have this kind of traditional media as well as traditional repression that's working on the censorship side and on the content creation side. I guess this we can call, potentially we can call propaganda. Patriotic education reform has been happening over the past few decades and that is going from kindergarten to college. And so in terms of the impact of, uh, of the education curriculum, others have found that it has had a significant and meaningful impact on how people view the Chinese government as well as uh, China's place in the world. Okay. So I've shown you a bunch of strategies. I think the natural question to ask is, what is this all for? Is it effective? There are many, many different ways to conceptualize efficacy. Uh, what I'll show you today is a look at one strategy and one, uh, I, I may not, maybe it's incorrect to say it's efficacy, but the impact or the consequences of the Great Firewall and the, this limit on transnational information flows. Okay. 
So the question that we're asking in this paper, which is co-authored, I should say, with Ying Dan Lu, Jack Schaefer, Kang Wu Park, and um, Zhang Sak Ju, uh, is there's this extensive system of information control. How much information flows into China from the global information ecosystem, and then how does it flow into the country? And we do this, we answer these questions using a, co a combination of computational uh, methods as well as qualitative investigations. <coughs> so the, the, what we're trying to get at is topics of global public attention and <coughs> public discussions in China. So our proxy for global public discussion, you can debate whether how good of a proxy this is, is tweets that go viral. Um, and then our proxy for public discussion in China is discussion on Weibo. So one of the platforms, the one that is, I would argue, most public. So just giving some background on Twitter and Weibo. Twitter, uh, both are micro blogs where uh, content that people post for the most part can be seen by many, including those who are not immediately in your network. Uh, Twitter, as of the time of this, we were gathering data in 2021, had just over 200 million daily active users. Most are outside of the US. And so that's also why we think Twitter, is, we can use this as a proxy for global public discussions. Then in terms of Weibo, about 250 million daily active users, almost entirely within the People's Republic of China. Uh, okay. And, and I, I just, be, uh, we, we, again, I'm happy to answer questions about why these two platforms, but our thinking was, if there is something happening with a high level of uncertainty, these are the platforms that you're, you were more, more likely to go to first to gain information. Uh, so for me in California, if I feel like shaking, then I would go to Twitter and try to figure out, has there been an earthquake? I wouldn't go to Facebook, I wouldn't go to Reddit, I wouldn't go to YouTube. And similarly in China, if there's something happening that is highly uncertain, I think yes, you may go to WeChat, um, but I think it depends on what you think the scale of that event is. And so we're looking for global discussions, things that transcend specific communities. So what we do is use existing data um, related to COVID-19 from Twitter and Weibo. So we're looking at a time period when COVID was first spreading outside of China. So everything I'm gonna show you, you can think of more likely as a ceiling for the inflow of information. Because this is a time where uh, China is highly salient to the world and where those living in China uh, were very interested in what was happening elsewhere related to COVID. Okay. So we use this corpus from Chen et al. of 14 million English language uh, tweet IDs related to COVID from January to April of 2020. We then uh, select those that have a certain set of China related keywords resulting in 1.8 million tweets. And then we only look at a small subset of these viral tweets. Specifically, we look at the top 10 most retweeted tweets per week. So that's just 150 viral tweets. In this figure on the right, the x-axis, uh, sorry, the y-axis is the retweet count, it's a log scale. And what you can see is this is the 1.8 million uh, China-related tweets. And then this is the 150 tweets in our sample. So the average retweet count in our sample is much, much higher than all the China-related tweets. You may also notice that there are few China-related tweets uh, that have higher retweet count than what's in our sample. It's actually not that easy to see here, but there are some. And that's because the, there's variation across weeks in the retweet count. So in one week when COVID was super salient, the 20th most retweeted tweet actually has a higher retweet count than the fifth most retweeted tweet in another week. Okay. So we're working with this set of 150 most viral tweets. So again, this is why you should think of everything I'll show you as a ceiling. These are the, these are the tweets that have gained the most attention globally. Uh, and then for Weibo, we use a, the Weibo Cove data set. This is uh, 40 million Weibo posts that were gathered in April 2020. So this was ga gathered post hoc. So this is January to April data gathered in April 2020. So it's post censorship. 
what they did was identify active users on Weibo, ended up with about 20 million active users, and they collected all of their posts in April. We also do the same tests on uh, the Weibo Scope COVID data set, which was collected and closer to real time, so pre-censorship. Uh, but we chose to use the Weibo Code data set because it has a much broader sample of users. We actually don't find any different uh, uh, substantive differences when we use the Weibo Code data set. So, um, uh, so from this 40 million data set, there are 6.7 million COVID-related posts from January to April of 2020. Uh, and the reason why we, so we're limiting the time frame. And then we're also using a uh, classifier to identify COVID-related tweets. So this data set is supposed to be all about COVID, but they're using almost 200 keywords in order to identify posts. And when you have that large number of keywords, you're going to have a lot of false positives. So we train the classifier to remove those. So for example, there are posts that are talking about, talking about outbreak. Outbreak was one of the keywords. But they're not talking about the COVID outbreak. They're talking about previous outbreaks. So the classifier excludes that. And so the target is this 6.7 million COVID-related posts. So we have 150 viral tweets, and we're looking for them in the 6.7 million COVID-related posts data set. And so the, the, our, our goal is to determine whether the English viral tweets co-occur in Chinese on Weibo. So that's the uh, computational task. And it's challenging. You might expect is challenging, it's multilingual, uh, English to Chinese, it's cross-platform. Weibo doesn't have the character limits that uh, Twitter does, and people are writing in very different socio-political, economic, cultural contexts, so the authors are very different, and it's the matching is large. So we've limited the end to 150, but you know, even if we limited the M, it would still be a very intensive and large task, definitely not something we can have humans, or we'd be around for a long time waiting for results if we were just having uh, human annotators do. And so what we do is use uh, deep learning methods to retrieve the top Weibo posts per viral tweet for human, actually the top 100 Weibo posts per viral tweet for human verification, and then the humans decide whether there's that co-occurring match. So we're using the computational methods to narrow down the field, and then having human annotators check. Um, I should say that going forward, we may be less reliant on human coding because this is, can also serve as a um, training or test or evaluation set for other methods. But since this is the first time we were doing it, we knew that we had to have the human annotation uh, if not, if, for nothing else than verification, validation purposes. All right, so our method has two, three steps, retrieval, ranking, and human annotation. For the retrieval step, our goal is just reduce the number of target Weibo posts from 6.7 million for every tweet to something smaller. And one way we do that is limiting the time frame. So we only look at Weibo posts plus or minus five days of the tweet timestamp. I'll give you examples later on that show you why we need Weibo posts before the tweet. Uh, because the, the, the tweet is just a proxy for global public conversations. We're not looking at how content flows from Twitter to Weibo. We're looking at how content flows from the world into Chinese social media. Um, OK, uh, so that time frame, plus or minus five days, really limits the data. For this first step, we translate the tweets into Chinese using the Google Translate API. We also did it manually and found that there were no significant differences between the Google and the human RA translation. Um, then we are using word to vec embedding to, on a, on a um, uh, word to vec that, we trained, that I trained for another project using Weibo data. So uh, for each source tweet, we're just using cosine similarity to identify the top 10,000 Weibo posts that have the most, uh, that are most similar. So we're limiting the Weibo posts, the plus or minus five days. We are um, comparing then the embedding of the Weibo posts to the translated embedding of the tweet and just taking the top 10,000 most similar. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. That's retrieval. 
then we rank those 10,000 candidates. And there we're using a uh, contextual embedding, a uh, universal sentence encoder that uh, performs, uh, it takes more into account than a static embedding such as word to back. And the reason why we don't do um, universal sentence encoder for the whole data set is just for computational cost reasons. We actually ended up running this on everything <laughs> in the end for comparison. But uh, we, end, we, we stuck with this method because the results at the end of the day weren't that different. And this was, so our, rank, uh, our retrieval then ranking approach was much more computationally efficient. So using word to vec we could match 150 tweets to 1 million Weibo posts in two hours. Using universal sentence encoder, it took 135 hours for that same amount uh, using the same machine configuration. So um, it's not, it wasn't worth it for us. <laughs> but then for the ranking step, we did use uh, this contextual embedding. And so I'm sure some of you are familiar with um, universal sentence encoder. But for those who are not, it's splitting sentences into subwords. So a word like concentrate would be split into three. Uh, and then. Um, it's taking into account the context of the sentence in generating the, uh, the embedding. This is an so like, uh, English example would be the word duck in something like word to vec would have the same embedding always. But the word duck would have different embeddings uh, for universal sentence encoder depending on whether you're talking about the, the animal or the action of like duck, um, like don't duck. Catch the ball. I don't know. Um, so, so the this captures that context. And to implement it, we're using a multilingual version on TensorFlow that's trained on uh, like Google 60 million web scale corpora. So we're not doing translation here. This is a multilingual model. We're taking the tweet in English and doing uh, doing the contextual embedding and comparing it to the Chinese Weibo posts. So the model is multilingual. There's no translation. And then the question is, uh, OK, we can rank, but then it's still too much for humans to evaluate all 10,000. So how many do we have them look at? So we need to set the k most similar tweets, um, most similar Weibo posts from the candidates. And to determine the optimal k, we look at how many matches do we get as we increase k. So if k is too low, then we risk missing matches. But if k is too high, it just becomes more time consuming. As you can see, at about 40, you are getting most of the matched tweets. And then it flattens out as we go higher. So in the end, we did um, do select k equals 100 for all, of the, for all of the tweets. OK, so then once we have this k equals 100, we had bilingual Chinese and English speakers evaluate the tweet and the, uh, and the Weibo post. And we said it was a match if it covers the same, top, same issue, same specific issue, regardless of the sentiment. So the Weibo post didn't have to agree. It just had to talk about the same thing. Okay. All right, so that's co-occurrence. We're trying to look at inflow. We want to know the direction of the information. And to do that, we conducted qualitative investigations of each co-occurrence. Um, so to define inflow, it's when events, actions, ideas, and opinions discussed in a tweet uh, originated outside of China and then made its way into China. So, so that eliminates anything that the Chinese government does. So if the government has a new policy, it's discussed on Weibo, that's not inflow. But if the Chinese government has a policy that leads to an opinion outside of China, and that opinion makes its way back into China, that is inflow. Okay? So the inflow can be not just events and actions, but also ideas and opinions. Uh, again, it's issue-based. It's not agreement-based. And we made sure that it was a concrete issue instead of a general topic. So let's say a tweet and a wave of post both talk about electric vehicles. If they weren't making the same point about electric vehicles, we would not say that that was inflow, unless the Weibo post explicitly cited the, the tweet, which does happen sometimes. Okay. 
Um, and so to do this qualitative investigation, we examine not just the Weibo post and its metadata and the tweet and its metadata, but also uh, search to Weibo and Twitter for other similar content, use Baidu and uh, Google search in Chinese and English to try to find content, similar content, because we really want to understand how this information flowed into China. All right, so turning to the results of what we find. All right, this is not meant to be legible, it's just to give you an idea of the 150 viral tweets, and this is our time period of 2020. Uh, the y-axis is again this log retweet count. Among the 150 viral tweets, we find 68 co-occurrences. And the co-occurrences are happening throughout the time period. But of those 68 co-occurrences, only 32 constitute inflow. So of the remainder, most are outflow. So remember, this is when COVID is happening in China. The rest of the world has started happening, but not in January. So, and there are a few that was ambiguous. We couldn't figure out where the idea initially originated. <coughs> um, and so about a quarter of global conversations, these are the most retweeted tweets. They got a lot of attention around the world. They relate to COVID-19 and to China, flowed into China. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is likely a ceiling uh, because we're looking at a highly salient time, a, highly, a topic that was highly salient for that time. We're looking at the most retweeted tweets. So just, just to be clear here, let's say we looked at all tweets pertaining to COVID in China. And we looked at what proportion of all tweets would flow into China. My guess is it would be lower than a quarter. Um, we're expanding the pool, but there's going to be fewer matches. Uh, in terms of what information flowed into China, uh, it's not primarily misinformation. So about 4% of the viral tweets contain misinformation. And then of the inflow, 6% contain misinformation. So similar amounts of information were circulating globally and made its way into China. What was disproportionately going into China is content that was antagonistic toward China. So 37% of the 150 viral tweets contain antagonism toward China. This could include the Chinese government, Chinese policies, as well as Chinese people. And then of the inflows, though, uh, two thirds were antagonistic toward China. So there was a disproportionate inflow of content that was antagonistic. And so what this means, if you're in a kind of controlled information environment like China, is that inside the country, your perception of how the world is talking about China is much more negative than what was actually occurring if you're outside of the country. So outside of the country, yes, there was absolutely racism directed toward Chinese people. There was criticism directed toward the Chinese government. But there was also a lot of sympathy and support for what China was going through, um, as well as praise for certain uh, strategies that uh, actions that the Chinese government took, like building a hospital in two days or three days. Um, but you didn't see that if you were in China's limited information environment. Um, so then turning to how did the information flow into the country, we identified four mechanisms of information flow. The first is through state media or government accounts. We define this as media outlets that are directly controlled or registered to a communist party or government agency. Then there's commercialized media, which, I mean, all media in China have some government affiliation, but we're saying there's commercialized media, which is not directly registered to, the, to a government or party agency. So an example would be like Sina News. So these are platform outlets that uh, have news. Okay, then uh, Weibo users who are not affiliated with the government or any media outlet, and then foreign entities. So starting with uh, state media and government. In February of 2020, the Wall Street Journal published an opinion piece that was called China is the real sick man of Asia. So there was a lot of discussion in the US about kind of this like racism uh, here. Uh, this happened, and then two weeks later, Chinese state outlets, CGTN, People's Daily, post on Weibo that Wall Street Journal reporters have been expelled from China. So just to be clear, this, opinion piece, this is an opinion piece in Wall Street Journal, not written by any foreign correspondents in China. But China, two weeks later, expelled uh, Wall Street Journal reporters from the country. Uh, after that expulsion, four hours after that expulsion was announced on Chinese state media, 
uh, Pompeo, then Secretary of State Pompeo, tweets, the United States condemns the move by China to expel three Wall Street Journal journalists. Mature, responsible countries understand that a free press reports facts and expresses opinions. China should not restrict hashtag free speech. Uh, so this is a tweet. This is uh, an opinion that ex is expressed by a figure outside of China. And then what we see is four days later, information about Mike Pompeo's statements make its way back into Chinese social media because the Beijing Review posts a video to its Weibo accounts talking about the Wall Street Journalist reporter expulsion as well as the Pompeo's remarks. So Chinese state media is bringing information in about what, a, um, what, what uh, Pompeo said about China. We also see a couple of examples where embassies are transmitting information into China. So one example is in late March, Spanish media reported that Chinese testing kits were defective. The Chinese, and Chinese embassy in Spain refuted this allegation on its Twitter account. And then uh, Chinese media outlets, kind of domestic Chinese media outlets, reported on the Chinese embassy's response. So that's how kind of this initial Spanish media reporting about Chinese testing test kits uh, uh, made its way into China. Similarly, in mid-April, a German media outlet criticized China's COVID response. That gained a lot of attention on Twitter. The Chinese embassy in Germany responded, and they posted a response on Twitter and in German and in Chinese. And then they copied that response to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website in German and in Chinese. And the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website is obviously accessible in China, so that's how this information uh, gets into China. Then you see Weibo users discussing it and Chinese media outlets reporting on it. In total, we have 10 instances out, um, of state media and government transmitting information into the country. In terms of commercialized media, uh, one example is NetEase News uh, reports that the WHO convened a meeting to declare COVID a uh, global emergency, and Weibo users immediately started sharing this information. And it actually gained attention, went viral on Weibo before Twitter because of the time difference. Uh, but this is still an inflow of information because the WHO is making a decision outside of China, information about this coming into the country. This is um, another example where commercial media played a role. So here, Pompeo is cascade, criticizing the Chinese government for delaying a report to the WHO about the origins of COVID. Then Guan Zhou Wang, which is quite nationalistic, but it doesn't meet our definition of state media. It uh, criticizes Pompeo's criticism and posts uh, its kind of analysis of Pompeo onto its online forum Weibo account and WeChat account. And after Guan Tai Wang writes about this, then you see lots of accounts on Weibo talking about it, including other government accounts and state media accounts. And then it's not until one day later that Pompeo actually tweets his press conference, uh, or posts a snippet of his press conference as a tweet. So again, this is an example where you have inflow, but what's happening on Weibo is happening before the tweet. So we have to think of, for this research, the tweet is just the proxy for something um, that captured global public attention, and the inflow could happen even if the discussion on Weibo is happening before the discussion on Twitter. Um, so then looking at Weibo users, we see examples um, of information transmitting just purely on social media. So this is a tweet, I don't know if you remember this, February 28th, 2020, coronavirus-like pasta, Chinese invented it, Italians spread it all over the world. A Weibo user geolocated in Brazil reposted this on Weibo. Uh, there's no reporting by any traditional media outlet that we can find in facilitating this inflow. Um, and then we also see Weibo users posting content from BuzzFeed, Fox News, New York Times, PBS to Weibo. Uh, okay, and then I will show you this example, which I think really illustrates how even though digital communication technologies facilitate the flow of information across borders, there are lots of different entities and actors that are part of this flow. It's not simply social media, social media flow. Okay, so on April 3rd, an editor of an Indian media site 
posts a video of a news clip from an Urdu television station to Twitter saying that China sent masks to Pakistan and they were made from underwear. Okay, so that's a tweet. Two days later, uh, the Business Standard, which is an Indian newspaper, reports, writes an article about these masks sent to Pakistan, citing the tweet. Then uh, the same day, you have an uh, overseas Chinese media outlet, the Tang Dynasty Television, which is extremely anti-CCP, created by Falun Gong adherents. It is banned in China. They report on this kind of mask issue, citing both the tweet and the Business Standard article. And then you see a Weibo user uh, later that same day seeing, posting about the new Tang Dynasty television article on Weibo and saying it's fake news. So this is how information is making its way onto Weibo. It's very convoluted. It includes media outlets in different countries. Uh, it includes media professionals and includes social media users. So in all uh, 12 instances out of 32, we see Weibo, ordinary Weibo users transmitting information inward. And then finally, there's three instances where foreign entities are posting information directly. Russian embassy posts on Weibo, its Weibo and WeChat account that travel, Russia's banning travel from China. We see MIT Tech Review posting about uh, hacking and fraud related to COVID. And then an Australian TV channel posting to its Weibo account about tensions between Australia and China over COVID origins. Okay, so I've said a lot. Um, I'm gonna stop here. I just wanna emphasize three points. One is that when we think of digital communication technologies in China, we have to think about it in the context of the Chinese government and the desire of the Chinese Communist Party to use digital communications and digital technologies to serve its goals and preserve its power. Um, there are a lot of different strategies that the Chinese government is using uh, to control information and it ranges from domestic to transnational content uh, removal to content creation. The, I should say one of the reasons I talked about the inflow Great Firewall um, uh, paper in more detail is that this is the type of strategy that other countries are copying the most. So most countries around the world cannot do content removal like the Chinese government because global social media platforms or US-based social media platforms are dominant in almost all countries except for China. So it, if you're Iran, even though you've tried to kind of limit the use of Twitter, everyone's still using Twitter. Um, but the sort of internet, sorry, countrywide filtering is something that we're seeing more and more countries copy. And so with this great firewall in China, you see that even at a time where you have a highly salient topic, where inflow is most likely, only a quarter of content that goes viral globally is reflected in discussions, online discussions in China. But I think what's interesting is that it is not the case that the Chinese government is a sole gatekeeper of information. You also do see individuals with no organizational institutional affiliation facilitating inflows of information uh, via social media into China. Okay, so I'll stop here and look forward to your comments and your questions.